Hi, good morning and welcome to Java One. Great to see so many people here. Um, is it too loud? Can we get the mic up a bit? Can everyone hear me now? Perfect. So great to see so many people here in the morning. I guess half of you are jet lag, so it's sort of easy to get up. Um, I'm going to talk today together with uh, Dave Keenan. Dave Keenan is the performance architect at Oracle within Java, so both for the JDK libraries and the JVM. I'm product manager for the JVM, so working with Hotspot and uh, JRocket. And we're going to talk about uh, why we think sort of it's time to switch to Java SC7 or JDK7. Um, we're going to try to focus as much as possible on why it's sort of interesting or why it's beneficial to switch to it even if you're not using any of the Java SE features. We're going to talk a bit about those, but uh, the focus will be more on just general benefits if, even if your code is Java, Java SE 6, for example. The standard Oracle slide, you'll see it a few more times this week. Um, I'm going to start off with a bit of why we think Java SE 7 or JDK 7 is mature and why we recommend it. Uh, Dave is going to go into a bit more into sort of the new features that it has, um, some of the, the performance benefits, and then we'll end with sort of backwards compatibility, which has always been a, one of the key points in, in Java, and then just a quick summary at the end. And we should have some time for questions before we end the session as well. So mature and recommended. Um, Java 7 was uh, sort of long overdue and a long for release and it got picked up in a fairly rapid tempo once we released it uh, in, back in July last year. And even within six months, Zero Turnaround, they did a study with their developers and, and users of their technology and they found that 23% were already up and running on, on JDK 7, which was quite impressive within six months. And just last month, Jelastic did a report on how the, their job which JDKs were being used in their um, deployments in their cloud service that they provide. And during the summer, it had completely shifted. So now 80%, almost 80% were up and running on JDK 7. So it's a clear testament that people are actually already on JDK 7, and it's been roughly a year. <coughs> so as I said, it's been a year since GA. Um, during this year, I believe the JDK 7 has matured immensely. We have had seven update releases with bug fixes, security fixes, new features being added in these update releases, and also a bunch of performance enhancements. And I can't so, sort of say enough how happy we are with the community picking up, helping us out, testing it, and uh, also Java ISVs doing products on top of it. And of course, we have all the Oracle stack that's basically, well, most of it is basically running Java, and we've been testing and trying it out there uh, during this year. And releasing a Java new JDK or a Java update for that matter is similar to what happens when um, World of Warcraft, for example, is released. You have, they have a bunch of testers, they probably log 20,000, 200,000 hours of test time before they release. And then they release an hour later, they have 2 million hours of game time. And it's similar when we release the JDK on an auto update. That say, uh, just after we have released, we have sort of more runtime than we can ever sort of get in our labs. So we appreciate your help with, with doing this type of testing and picking up early. And that's why we have the early access bill that was mentioned yesterday in the keynotes. So please pick those up and, and uh, help us get more testing and more stable products out there. And today, sort of a year later, we also see that it's certified, it's supported by all the major IDEs, development tools, JUnit or code coverage um, applications, the Java E servers, both Glassfish, WebLogic, JBoss, Tomcat, etc. support JDK 7. So they're independent of what stack you're using, Java SE 7 is supported today. And from Oracle's perspective, we recommend JDK 7 for any new deployment on the server side, the independent of stack there, or especially if you're doing a client application. It is the default JRE on java.com, so if someone installs Java today and don't have it before, they're gonna get JDK 7. We're about to turn on auto update, um, and that's gonna sort of make, make sure that we have Java 7 um, just across all the installations on the, on the client side as well.
and this was mentioned a bit yesterday, we support all the platforms we did before. We have the Windows, Linux, Solaris on both Intel, or sorry, x86 and 64-bit um, x86 Spark and 64-bit Spark. And sort of during the summer here, we added Mac OS X. So if you're doing development, you can use JDK 7 both in your development environment on your Mac and in deployment. And if you're doing hobby projects on a Raspberry Pi or doing embedded projects, you have a full JDK available for uh, Linux on ARM, and it supports both ARM v6 and ARM v7. And if you want to drill down into exactly which OSs we, we certify on, uh, you can go to the Oracle page on the o Oracle Technology Network. You have the link here, which basically if you search for uh, Java and certified platforms, you're going to find this, and you'll see it in the slides later on. So support um, around Java SE 6 and 7. Um, Java SE 6, we're going to end the public, uh, publicly available sort of update releases early next year. And this is, follows the standard that has been set a long time ago um, around how we handle the, the public updates of Java. Um, we can't continue to sort of have uh, sort of spread our resources so thin that we continue to provide updates um, publicly for everything. So what we set, what was set up was the rule that three years, minimum three years after the GA release, minimum one year after the next major release, and six months after it becomes the default JRE. Um, so in all these three are sort of fulfilled now with Java SE 6. The three years since it was released is definitely sort of overdue. And with the six months from uh, being default, we made uh, with 7U5, I believe it was, we made that the default JD, JRE on our Java.com. So looking at these numbers, Java SE 7 has, is going to have public support at least until 2007, 2014. So if you're running an a open source stack, for example, and you don't want to pay for support, we're going to provide support if you're interested. We have support contracts for that. But if you want to run a completely free stack, you should start looking at upgrading to JDK 7. And our talk here, we're going to focus mainly on the open JDK, or sorry, the Oracle JDK, JDK 7. But a lot of the things that we're talking about here today are valid for other JDK implementations or Java SE 7 implementation out there. We do ourselves most of our work in open JDK. So a lot of the features that we put in goes into OpenJDK. So if you're running OpenJDK 7, you're going to have a lot of the benefits that we're talking about. If you're running um, uh, implementation from one of the Java SE licensees like SAP, HP, Fujitsu, they all have JDK 7 uh, products out there today supported on their U Unix system, for example, for, for SAP and HP UX. IBM has their own implementation with uh, their J9 JVM where they put in new features into um, their JDK 7. They have the balance GC they talked about last year as part of their JDK 7 release. And they also optimize their class libraries. <coughs> so with that, I'm going to leave over to Dave, who's going to go into a bit more, a bit more about the technical stuff. But All right, hello, everyone. I'm Dave Keenan. I am the performance architect. So we're going to talk about new features and performance now. Starting with new features. OK, so development. Our, our focus moving forward is, is clearly for development to be in JDK 7 update releases and JDK 8. So performance features, new features, um, you know, um, things that would benefit you as a, within an update um, are going to go into 7. So um, you're not going to see those in 6. 6 is not completely frozen, obviously. We're going we're to maintain security and, and, and bug fixes and so forth. But for those that we're used to, you know, hey, I get a new update. Sometimes I get a new hotspot version, and, and it's going to be you know, a bit faster. That's, that stops in 6. In fact, that should have stopped. What, 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 what version did that stop in? 25, yeah. All of our, you know, the last drop of performance work went into the, we did go into 25. All right, thank you, Stefan. Okay. Actually, let me just get back, just to drive this this home a bit. So, I mean, you know, this is something that you got, you have to be, you know, considering moving forward as well. Um, you know, we have to be able to focus our efforts, and, and and that's what we're doing. Okay. So, serviceability features that are that have come from JRocket that are now in Hotspot. 
um, due to the, the J-Rocket hotspot conver convergence. Uh, Java Mission Control has, it has come in, in a 7 update. Um, it's, it's, its core focus is monitoring, managing, and profiling your application. Um, for those who are J-Rocket users, this is a, a big benefit, and we're really happy to see this over in, 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 in hotspot. So um, it's new tooling for those that are used to using OpenJDK and hotspot, and um, I think you'll find it quite useful. So the same thing goes for Flight Recorder. Um, a bit more detailed um, you know, uh, than Mission Control. Mission Control gives us a good overview, more of a graphical display, and, and Flight Recorder gives us the, 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 the nitty-gritty uh, information that we're looking for from a development point of view. Um, it's partially implemented in JDK 6, 7, so you know, it, it's really just the Oracle uh, Fusion middleware probes at this point. Um, you know, we, we needed to start somewhere and wanted to get a feature out, so that was in 7 Update 4. Um, and uh, the, the re remainder is targeted in the, in the next year. Okay, moving forward to diagno more diagnostic commands, um, specifically targeting JDK introspection. Uh, J command, another command that another tool that came from JRocket. Um, you know, it's 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 a it's a you know, framework for easy implementation of, of additional tooling, um, a quick integration of your of your tooling to to use introspection into the JDK. Um, as it stands now, um, you know, it, it's got about 15 different commands that it supports that come with it. If you just do J command, you'll see uh, a list of the, the, the running Java processes. And if you do a J command with the PID of a Java process with a help, you'll see all the tools that are available. I've got a, a list here of, of a few. So, you know, heap dumps, um, finalizations being run, um, you know, the flags that you're running with, Things like that. It gives pretty detailed information of a running process with, low, with, with generally low overhead. Now, that being said, a class histogram is one of the things that, 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 that it can give you. And depending on the size of your application, obviously, that could be significant overhead. Um, we do our best to keep it low. Um, so, you know, for those that have used, to, used Hotspot and, and other OpenJDK tools in the past, it was always a, a few different commands that, to get this information. The information was there. This is consolidated under one command. Um, you know, it's a lot, lot less jumping around, a lot less using, you know, uh, various different tools. It's, it's, it's consolidated here. Okay. Again, moving forward, uh, the next feature we'll have to talk about is Garbage First. Garbage First is a new um, garbage collection framework that we have. First fully supported for production use in 7 Update 4. Um, our, 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 as it stands now in production, what we generally recommend for G1 is large heaps. If you're looking to run more than a 6 gig heap, um, and you want stable, you know, low latencies, you know, we say less than five sec 0.5 seconds here, but, um, you know, 200 milliseconds is the default that G1 is going to try to go after. Um, it is a soft real-time collector, so it's going to do the best it, it possibly can to achieve its, its, its response time goals, but it's not going to, you know, throw your application under the bus <laughs> in order to achieve it as a, as a hard real-time collector would do. Um, and we've got, had a lot of success with it. Um, you know, basically, if you've got... Uh, you know, an application that has a live, a high live data count greater than 50%. Um, you've got a, a variable object allocation rate. Maybe it's a bit bursty. Um, if you if you're suffering from long GCs and compaction pauses, a compaction pause meaning like a, a full GC where you're running into a situation where you have fragmentation on the heap and you're not, you're just not able to get free enough free uh, free space for your allocations. Um, G1 shines with, with with high levels of fragmentation. Um, mainly because it's a, it's a parallel and concurrent compacting collector where we don't, you know, Hotspot hasn't had such, such a thing in the past. Um, we, we, we did have a low pause collector in CMS, it's been very successful, but it does not compact. So if you get to the point where your fragmentation is too high, you have a full GC, which is painful, but that's why we have G1. So as you see here, in a typical uh, 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 you know, Java E application, um, You'll see that the parallel GC is, you know, very long GC. That's the big bar. That's parallel old GC, and you see very long pauses. The two little ones are, are the first of which is G1, and the second of which is CMS. So you can see that G1 is close to CMS in this situation. It's not beating CMS, um, but it, it is rather close. So, so why is that? Um, there's a lot of machinery that we pull around with G1 actually to achieve these low pause times, mainly barriers, memory barriers. And um, you know, that's something that the parallel collectors in CMS simply don't have to deal with. So there's overhead. Um, you know, as time goes on, we'll be optimizing that to, to, achieve, to uh, surpass CMS performance. But right now, in a, in a typical Java application, it's close to CMS. So, so what it does do that CMS doesn't do is handle those high levels of fragmentation very, very well. 
Um, you'll notice that the parallel collector, in this case, does better with fragmentation than CMS. And the main reason there is that it's a, it's a parallel old generation collector. So when it, has to, when it actually gets to the point where it has to do a compaction and it has to handle the fragmentation, the parallel old GC is parallel in that regard. It's going to be fast. Um, CMS, when that happens, it's a single-threaded process. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's single-threaded in that regard. And, um, you know, the, the, the full generation compaction in CMS is going to be slow. However, look at G1. It handles it gracefully. Um, so regardless of the size of your heap, um, we now have a collector that we're pretty confident saying that, you know, hey, you know, we can, we can achieve pretty low pause times. Regardless of the, the size of the heap that you have, regardless of the level of fragmentation that you have, and regardless of how bursty your application is. You know, is it perfect? No. I mean, it's a new framework. Um, but it is indeed fully su supported in production. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of confidence about how, how well it's doing at this point. All right. Moving forward. Runtime compiler optimizations, tier compilation. Tier compilation is something that we've worked on for quite some time. Um, and here in Java 7, it is still not on by default, but it's, it's, it's definitely worth looking at. Um, tier comp, well, we've always had uh, several compilers in Hotspot. We've always run out with an interpreter, and if you're running on a, on a client, you'd run the C1, our client compiler. If you're running on a server, you'd run on C2, our server compiler. And um, what tier compilation does is, is, is it's, it's, the, it's the union of them. It's, it's, we first run an interpreter. The interpreter um, provides information to compile into an instrumented C1. Um, we use that instrumented instrumentation in C1 to optimize for C2. So it's a, it's a, it's a two-phase optimizing compiler. Um, the information that we get to optimize in C2 is better than it was in the past because we're actually, you know, it's not just interpreted information, it's from a compiler. Um, so we're running optimized code and, and instrumenting that optimized code to be able to make our optimization choices for the, for the, the highly optimized server. Um, so why isn't it on by default? It was actually very close. Um, and the main reason is, is that um, it's, it, the heuristics that we have for the code cache uh, ended up being uh, a bit, there, there was some corner cases that we weren't very happy about with very, very large applications. So as you got a lot of code and you're compiling a lot of code, um, the code cache where all the optimizations, go, all, all your compiled code go into was running out of space. Um, and we, 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 need to, we need to have a better way of, of, of managing that um, before we make it on by default. Um, so, if you decide to use tier compilation, and I do highly suggest that you give it a try. Um, if it doesn't improve your performance, take a look at reserved code cache and make sure that you have enough code cache. Um, we did increase it by default to 96 megabytes, but it's, you know, for large applications, it's not enough to, to, to um, you know, and not, not stable. Well, stability is not the problem, it's just that we had those corner cases that we, we were not terribly happy with, so. Um, it will be on in the, by default in the future. All right. Socket Direct protocol and Finiband to support. So we have transparent IB network support using regular sockets in Java 7 now. Um, it is not on by default. You need to, do to make a, you need to create an STP configuration file um, and set the system property that specifies the location of that file, but the, di the directions are, you know, right here. It's basically, if you just do, S you can search for STP on, on um, you know, the docs for oracle.com and, and uh, you'll, you'll find it. Um, okay, very good. Now, performance benefits. I, I, I try to focus uh, specifically on those performance benefits that you would get just moving to JDK 7 initially. No, not using any of the features, not, not taking advantage of any of the new language features. So what happens if you just drop JDK 7 in, in, in your application? As I went through this, there are just a couple of features that I couldn't ignore. <laughs> so I, I'm mentioning them anyway, so you, you'll see those. Um, all right, class library uh, um, changes. Um, there, there was a, quite a bit of a contention in date, um, and date is pretty heavily used in Java E applications. So the hash table that that date, um, which is synchronized, is now a concurrent hash map, um, which alleviated the synchronization bottlenecks we were running into. Big decimal improvements, maybe mainly reducing um, a few allocations that we could avoid and tightening up the path length. Um, Big decimal again is 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 heavily used used in, in, in business applications. We see a lot of its use within Oracle and other um, you know, enterprise applications. And um, if you see big decimal on a profile, uh, Java Seven certainly will improve it because uh, a lot of work went in to big decimal copy elision um, and Sun PKS JNI call. So we were doing extra copies as we went to the security layer using Sun PKS, and we 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 got rid of those copies. Um, if you can, can remove a copy or an allocation, um, you improve performance. 
Um, simple as that. So that's what we did. Um, all right. Again, moving forward, more crypto configuration changes. So, so, so in short, this is a, a rather simple change, but our, our default crypto, and um, as we um, instantiated crypto on, on, on Solaris and Linux, it was just not the quickest path. Um, there was a better way to do it. Um, it, was a, it was just a configuration file change, but that has been on, that's on by default in, in 7 now. Um, user land crypto for Spark T4. Um, so it's, uh, new to Spark T4 were, 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 were user crypto instructions, so we took advantage of those. Very large improvements on that platform. That went to 7U2 um, to the tune of, you know, factors faster in our, in our, in our, work, in our micro workloads. Adler 32, CRC 32. Um, we're leveraging those, those specific instruction sets on, on the T-Series as well. And uh, that also made it into 7U2. Okay. String to byte conversions. Um, again, this is an optimized string to care to byte um, uh, conversion, two to three X performance improvement in, in, in micro benchmarks. Um, you know, uh, these type of conversions are heavily used in, in a lot of applications, um, and uh, we, we've been doing you know, point optimizations with, with conversion for quite some time. Um, our, we've, we've focused uh, on some of the work we've done in, the, in the optimizing compilers to, to you know, optimize this, these type of code paths, um, but the libraries themselves needed some work in order for us to do that. So a combination of you know, revamping the, the, you know, what we're doing in the class libraries and making sure that Hotspot can optimize those new code paths more effectively is what we did here. Um, and there's there's more there there, there there's uh, more opportunities as we as we go on with string. The concurrency APIs. Okay, here's one of those that uh, you know it's a new feature. Um, there are improvements in JDK seven alone. If you're using GSR one sixty six, that's the concurrency APIs. JDK seven will be faster. Um, a good amount of work went in there. But one of the biggest features that came with um, one sixty six Y, what went into JDK seven, is fork join. Um, and the fork join framework is a, is, a, is a pretty slick tool, I have to say. So if, you, if you're uh, um, building new concurrency, uh, you know, uh, building new highly concurrent applications, fork join is probably something you want to consider as well. Oh, did my graphic not work? There you go, a little bit. All right. All right, more about fork join. Um, it's, it's, its framework, is, its goal is to take advantage of multiple, multiple processors, processors automatically. Um, and it's designed for tasks that can be broken down into little pieces. Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequences is, is a good example of that. And you know, a typical algorithm is, you know, can I manage this task? I'm gonna, uh, you know, if I can do that, if I, I'll perform it. You know, else, if I can break it up into many different, you know, smaller, similar tasks, you know, let's execute those and then join the results. Um, so uh, having that um, you know, uh, capability on, on multi-core systems simply, you know, greatly simplifies your, uh, you know, use of those multiple cores and multiple threads that are available. All right. We've updated the native compilers for JDK 7. You could take JDK 7 if, you, if, you're, if your Java application is bottlenecked on garbage collection. You could take JDK 7, drop it in, and you'll see a 20 to 30 percent improvement in garbage collection. It's just GCC and, and the Oracle Studio compilers are just that much faster. Um, on, the, on, on newer hardware, on actually any hardware, we, we've tested quite a few. The, great, the newer hardware obviously benefits more. You know, we're, we're generating better code for the new hardware, but in, in general, GCC 4.2 was a big improvement um, you know, across the board. Any really, really any native code. I say garbage collection because that's the, one of the biggest code paths for uh, biggest you know, aspect of, of the JDK that's native. Um, but we're seeing faster compilation. We're seeing faster network. It's it, it, was a, it was a good change. NUMA support in, JDK, in, in Java 7 on Linux. The requirements is you need 2619 kernel or later in glibc261. But if you've used, uh, used NUMA on Solaris, which has been supported for quite some time, significant performance improvement. Um, you know, the whole idea of what the NUMA allocator can do, is, this is the parallel old, parallel old GC and parallel GC only. We are working for it. We're working to move that to G1 in the future. Um, it's a, not an easy task, so I'm not gonna, I can't really project that one, but um, the idea with NUMA is to have uh, your young gener generation and all your allocation to be local to your NUMA nodes. So, you know, what was, you know, cross um, uh, you know, remote node allocations and accesses, um, you know, the large majority of your memory accesses in Java are allocation in the young generation, and that's all local to your NUMA nodes now. 
we interleave the old generation as well. Okay, next is the partial perm gen remover, removal. All right, so we partially removed the perm gen in, in, in JDK 7, and, and, the, and what we did was we moved the intern strings to the Java heap from the permanent generation. Um, it is, this, this, is our, this was our first step in that, in, in, along that path, and we're gonna, in, in the full, um, we come to completion in JDK 8. Um, one thing to notice, you may need to, to adjust your GC tuning because you know, all your, your, string, your intern strings are now in the heap, which they weren't before. Um, right. So you, if, you, if you notice that your applications have higher GC times and you didn't change anything, um, you know, take a look at uh, increasing your heap to, to, to uh, handle the, the string count um, as a larger heap may be needed. In general, string, intern strings don't take up a lot of space, so it's not a traumatic amount of memory that we're, that we're, we're, we're taking up in the heap at this point, and we were taking up in the perm gen anyway. Um, but uh, if you were on the cusp of, 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 of what your capacity was for, for, for the heap that you're running and you're doing a lot of garbage collection, you know, this might be that a little bit of change that could make it a bit worse for you. So. Okay, more on intern strings. I have a, a talk tomorrow that I'll go into more detail about this, this the JVM advanced tuning talk, um, but I'll just touch on it at this point. But intern strings are, are, are uh, um, managed internally in an internal uh, hash table, as are the distinct class names that, that are loaded. So there are two different hash tables. One is the string table, one is the system dictionary in the JVM. Both of which, as I said, are hash tables. Um, they are uh, locked hash tables on access and they have a default size of 1009. So, of those who know what a hash table does, if you have more than 1,009 entries, you start to increase your bucket chains, right? Now, the accesses are locked, so if you get, you know, as those chains start to get longer and longer, um, the critical region of your lock gets longer and longer and performance starts to suffer. So, the quick fix to that is increase your string table size. So, we have a flag for that in JDK 7. Um, actually, a pretty quick fix. You can, you can um, use... Uh, um, J hat and other um, you know, heap introspection tools to find out how many intern strings you're actually running. Um, you know, once you have an idea of that, what, what, how many intern strings you're, you're, you're using, you can set the string table size to that value. We've seen Java E applications use up to you know, 60,000, 70,000 intern strings. Um, so you can imagine that you know, that was a big performance <laughs> improvement um, because we were spending a lot of time in the string, string table. But um, it's, 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 it's an easy change, um, and um, it's worth looking into if, you, if you're not rec If you do an application profile using, well, I, I would suggest the Studio Analyzer, I mean, because it can, it can look into the, the, the JVM. Um, Vtune can do the same thing. And if you see string table accesses, this is, this is the problem. Um, you want to just increase that size. The other one is, is, is uh, the distinct class names. We, don't, we, we have this protected by the unlock experimental VM options. It is, it is um, supported to use this, um, but, but it's not, you know, we, we'd rather have this be more, it's, it's a less common case. Um, and uh, we want you to be aware that you are, you know, kind of twiddling with the internals if you, if, you, if you change this. It does not have a, a negative performance uh, penalty, making it too big. Um, just it, it, um, the, the, the distinct class name data structure is something that we want to be able to tune automatically, frankly. We don't want you to have to deal with that. We don't want to have to deal with string intern either, but it's more likely that you'll have to uh, deal with intern strings. So that's the reason why we have it protected by an experimental VM option, but it is indeed supported to use if you need it. We would like to know if you run into that, though. I mean, we have aliases on OpenJDK, so let us know. All right, client library updates. Nibis look and feel, um, you know, it, it, it's significant. Uh, Platform to, you know, as far as changing the, the, the look and feel for the the, cl the clients, um, matching Nimbus does a very good job of mapping matching the native look and feels better than what we had in the past with Metal. Um, we have some shaped and translucent windows for for, for APIs now. Um, we have uh, improvements to J Layer. I'm sorry, we including J Layer, which came out of Swing Labs. Uh, we have optimizations to the 2D rendering pipeline and X render support in Linux. So again, just running JDK 7 on, 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 on you know, your client application on Linux. Most of these are tar you know, improved on Linux, but um, you'll, you'll see that benefit. GDBC 4.1 updates. Okay, so we, um, there's some additional, well, 
there's some, some slight changes here to connection res, uh, result set and statement. General performance improvements as a whole as far as the, the implementation in the, in the JDK. Um, and additional classes are added to the, to the package as well. Um, you know, these, these are the, the, the distinct differences, but again, you would see that the, the, the packages of JBC, JDBC and JDK7 in and of itself is, is, is going to be faster. And XML API updates as well. We've updated JAXP um, you know, using Stacks 1 2. Significant performance improvements for JAXP. Um, updated JAXB for binding as well. Um, I was so actually, I, I didn't anticipate performance improvements with JAXB, but, JAXB, but we are actually seeing uh, um, you know, slight improvements in, in, in certain workloads. And JAX, uh, WS as well was updated. Again, the JAXP, if you're using that, they're, they're, the, the performance improvements were pre pretty significant. Okay, asynchronous I.O. New feature in JDK 7. You need to, to code to it, obviously, you're not gonna take advantage of it, but the reason why I'm bringing it up here is, is that it's been a long time coming, asynchronous I.O. in JDK, in, the, in Java. Um, so we had blocking I.O. You know, pre-JDK 1.4. We had non-blocking I.O. and memory map files and, and 1.4 moving, for, moving forward, but JDK 7 is the first um, uh, async, async I.O. implementation that we, that we have. Um, and it does take advantage of, of, of the operating system I.O. facilities where they are available on, say, Linux or Solaris. Windows too, right? I'm pretty sure that Windows has got a special, special case for that. Yes, they do. Okay, so here's a, just a general performance uh, of J, uh, Spec JBB 2005. This is one of the simple workloads that um, we had available to us to see to track uh, JDK development over time. Um, and this is through the course of the builds of JDK 7. So you see a slow trend of improvement from the 10th build all the way up to the 138th build. Um, this is uh, on uh, this is out of the box, no tuning. Uh, a 2.2x improvement. JBB 2005 is a relatively simple workload, but what, what it does stress well is memory allocation, memory locality, and code generation. Um, so, and you can see the last big jump between 120 and 138 was a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the code optimization work, uh, escape analysis, and, and others that went in late in JDK 7. All right, here's another slide. Yeah, it's not JDK 7, but I think you, you can see the, the trend here. Um, I, I kind of wanted to show what, um, you know, what, what our performance is over time if you, if, you, if you combine what we've done in hardware and what we've done in, in software as well. Am I uh, looking at the wrong slide? Sorry, that slide's old. This is the right slide. Oops. <laughs> um, all right, so this has combined hardware and software over time. We've had a collaboration with Intel. We have collaborations with a lot of the hardware vendors, AMD, you know, obviously Spark. Um, and uh, Intel wanted to specifically, tar specifically target JVB 2005 on their hardware. And a 14x combined improvement hardware and software over the last, well, five Intel CPU releases, about four years. Pretty massive improvement. Um, a little unfair, mainly because we didn't work with Intel before those four years. So <laughs> there was a there was a big backlog of work we had to do, but um, we, we we got that done, and uh, we we're, we're we're actually leading, as I'll show you in, in, in on, on the Intel platforms and a lot of workloads. Uh, the trend you see similar trends with AMD, actually quite similar with AMD. You'd see it different with Spark. I mean, we've been optimizing Spark a lot longer, so it's you're not going to see as big of a yield in the last uh, several releases, but it's. Uh, um, you know, uh, Intel is now x86 is a premier platform for us. All right, competitive landscape. All right, so right now, JBB 2005 for Java 7. Java 7 is leading that workload. It's IBM, IBM's J9 implementation that's doing it. Um, they are the four CPU performance leader at the moment. So uh, you know, JDK, IBM, you know, JDK seven implementation has been pretty solid. I, I, we've seen it, we've seen a lot of use in 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 the competitive uh, benchmarking 
worlds, and, and it's, it's been pretty successful. Um, Oracle Hotspot is the current performance leader with J Enterprise, uh, both x86 and Spark. And IBM also has the lead on, on the power performance workload of, of SSJ 2008. Okay, real world performance. All right, not a lot of content, but basically we've tested a lot of applications, many, many applications. Um, JDK 7 update 4, we wanted to be able to say and recommend that um, you know, 90% of the applications that we test run better on Java 7 than they do on both Java 6 and JRocket. Um, and it was, a very, it was actually quite a, quite a long project that we, we, we took this on. And, and the, the end result after, of course, fixing several issues is 97% of the applications that we tested are faster than JD, Java 6. And 96% are, are faster than, than, than JRocket. Those three few percentages that are left, we have bugs filed and we'll be addressing them in Java 8. Um, corner cases, truly, not, not anything that's a showstopper by, by, by any means. Okay, that brings us to backwards compatibility. And uh, I think we're doing pretty good on time. Sure. And we'll switch over to Stefan to talk about backwards compatibility. <clears throat> yes, I mentioned earlier in the talk we take backwards compatibility quite seriously with Java. Um, we have a Define three areas where we sort of always make sure we would try to stay as compatible as possible. We call it source compatibility, binary compatibility, and behavioral compatibility. And it's basically we want to make sure old code continues to compile with the new Java version. Uh, you can link, basically, you can load your old jar files that you have previously compiled and run them with, with your new Java 7 program. And also, if you do execution, or sort of when you execute your application, you want to, the behavior to be the same. You want to get the same result if you're running Java 7 as you were with Java 6. So those are the three areas we're looking at. And uh, we have a full document which describes sort of anything that we believe um, changes the compatibility. Um, so most of these things are sort of smaller things that we have changed or added a, a um, a method to, to an API, for example. So all those changes are documented. If you go to this page, you can actually see all the differences that are between six and seven that you um, could experience if, if you are unlucky. But most things are sort of very small, and we have basically no one running into them, but we want to document them anyway. I'm going to go through a couple of things that people actually have been, been seeing as they update. It is a new major release. It contains a lot of new features, a lot of new libraries. So while it's not so if, if you do, if when we do a minor update, a seven U update, we basically expect that to be a slot in replacement. You can take that and virtually sort of sure you want to do some certification or sort of some testing. But the idea is that the command line options are the same, um, everything works the same. The things that are have changed is bug fixes, and we strive very hard to make our bug fixes, our security fixes, sort of as backwards compatible as possible. So. This one, they talked a bit about uh, if you have sort of really fine-tuned uh, and balanced your perm gen and, and heap, you might want to take an extra look at that if you're in a memory-constrained environment. Uh, since we've moved things from the perm gen, it's going to be less usage there and more usage on the heap. And these are the two sort of main pitfalls, pitfalls that we have seen people experience when they update to JDK 7. And they have... Uh, so the first one is we are more stringent when doing bytecode verification on Java SE 7 classes. Um, it's mainly an issue if you're using sort of different compilers or if you're using a bytecode modifier to, um, for example, do code, code coverage, for example, that inserts new bytecode. So what we're verifying in this particular case here is uh, stack maps, which basically describes sort of how many things you have on the stack in a given point in time, and we're sort of, we want to make sure that we actually, sort of what the class file describes is actually sort of correct with what the bytecode um, executes and puts on the stack. There is a way to work around this. It's not recommended. You can sort of, this sort of use split verifier, uh, dash minus, so disable the split verifier. That's going to revert back to sort of how we did verification in JDK 6. It's, it's a short-term solution if you have an issue. What we've seen that 
code coverage tools, uh, third party compilers, et cetera, have all fixed their issues. So if you pick up JDK 7 now, unless you are sort of, you can't update um, some parts of your, uh, other parts of the stack, you shouldn't run into this issue at all. Another part that's changed is when you do reflection. So if you do reflection on the class, or you do get methods. If you read the, uh, the Java SE 7 API or the JDK API docs, you'll see quite clearly stated since 1.1 or since reflection was uh, added, the order of these methods will be sort of unspecified. Um, however, the Oracle JDK or Sun JDK have had an order of them. So the, the order was basically in the order they were stated in the class file. And with knowledge about this or sort of without um, sort of thinking about it, things started depending on this. Um, there is no workaround for this. You have to sort of make code changes if you run into this that, that you are depending on, on the order of uh, how methods are returned. Um, the quick fix would basically be to sort of return the methods and do some sorting on them on your level, but the, the, the JDK or the JVM won't be able to help you in that case. And the reason for this is basically we changed how we're, we're managing methods and sort of rather than punish everyone with the sort method, um, the, the, where, when you need to sort them, please do, do so. So some summary in the end. So hopefully we've been able to show a bit that what we believe is a, is a mature proven release. It's heavily used in, in, uh, by, by people out there already. Uh, you will be able to continue to get free public updates with Java SE 7. And as Dave talked about, there are several new features and there are plenty of performance improvements in JDK 7. And it's also the, from our pers point of perspective, the recommended release and it's a completely supported release and certified with a lot of tools out there. And just as a final comment, so we focus most on sort of, if I don't do anything, what do I get? And I think that in, in by itself is quite compelling. Um, but there are more to Java SE 7. There's a reason why we did a major release. We put in a lot of new code, and new libraries, and the new features. Um, there are several sessions this year talking about this. There's one on the four I've listed here um, with Joe Darcy and, and Anil and others would be probably interesting to go to. And we talked a bit about G1 on Wednesday morning. There's a G1 talk also early in the morning at 8.30, I believe, um, that I could highly recommend uh, going to. And also, if you don't want to go watch Pearl Jam and all the other things that are happening in the night, you can always log into Parlays and watch sessions from last year. They are up there still. And there you have a lot of talks about uh, Java SE 7 as well. And that's what we had. So we're open up for questions if people have. I don't know if we have a mic back there or if you just have to speak loudly and I'll try to repeat the question as much as possible. Thank you. So the question was, what's the difference between Open JDK and the Oracle JDK? And we we will sort of I would guess today like 95 percent of the code is basically the same. I would say it's probably more. We will sort of do some. We have the JVM convergence project as we mentioned briefly. Uh, we have some license features in JRocket like Flight Recorder, like Mission Control, that we will continue to have as license features and that will only be part of the Oracle JDK. But G1, basically all the, like, all the performance features that we're doing are all part of Open JDK. Yeah. So we're, sort of from, from our perspective, we, we have some features that we feel add sort of value externally and, and we like to compete with others on those and we have Yeah, J Java C and JDK seven is uh, absolutely sort of exactly the same. I don't know if yeah, there's th no difference. There should be no difference between those two. Right, and, and as 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 Stefan said, it's it's really uh, 
Um, the additional tooling like Vision Control, as you referenced, um, you know, that's the difference. As far as runtime, there is no difference. I mean, it's more or less, I mean, it's, it's just additional things that we would be able to, you know, add, add value and, 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 yeah. and, and, and yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, if, if you look at OpenJDK, you will see sort of in real time as we do development work of, of basically most of the code in, in sort of the JDK. So we take or the, the OpenJDK and then we sort of on top of that we add sort of flight recorder, et cetera. So nine, like most of our work is straight in OpenJDK. So you can follow the mailing list and see sort of as we add features, as we sort of do fixes. Uh, as for the difference between them, the Oracle JDK is the JDK that we provide support of or that we certify our platforms on and, and more, where a lot of the, the third party vendors as well sort of certify on. Yeah, th those are the binaries that are certified and tested. I mean, granted, the differences are probably pretty small, but yeah, that's, yeah. You know, that's what, what, we're, what we're testing. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, we, we are testing some of those, not all of them. Uh, a lot of the, the sort of how the certification generally works is like we, we provide certification against the OS and then the upper stack sort of needs to certify it on the JDK. But we do a lot of testing with sort of the upper stack to make sure. Yeah, but I, I, Stefan, I, we don't know of a tool that's not supported for JDK 7 as far as performance. No, I know that there were analysis. sort of some of the code coverage tool sort of during back in autumn last year as we released JDK 7 that ran into this code verify thing. But since then, there have gone in fixes and now they are fully functional. Is there a tool specifically that you're, you're speaking of? Or? Yeah, I, I know for a fact that it's fully supported, yeah. Yes, we won't go. We won't do a JDK seven on JRocket. Uh, we will continue to support JRocket for for sort of quite a bit of time. Uh, I think it runs at least until 2017. So we will continue to provide uh, support, bug fixes, security fixes, and all of those uh, benefits. Um, but we won't do any new sort of big feature work in JRocket. Uh, the new feature work that we're doing, we we, we are taking over the the features that we sort of feel like we're going to miss from JRocket or that we need from JRocket into the hotspot sort of JDK. Right. And from, from, from a performance perspective, if, if, we're not, if hotspot is not able to meet your you know, expectations that you have in JRocket, we consider that a bug. And it will be fixed. So. I'm sorry? If, if, if hotspot for some reason, as I said, you know, 96% of the applications that we tested are, are faster yeah. using hotspot. But if you find that your, your expectations aren't being met with hotspot, then we would consider that a bug and would fix that. Um, you know, we, we want uh, you know Hotspot and the Oracle JDK to be to to meet or exceed your expectations that you had with JRocket. And, and everything is going to be converted by eight. Yes, in the eight time frame, we'll see if we get everything into the GA. But uh, some most other things are are targeted for eight. Yes. How much faster is Java 7 than Java 6 on benchmarks? On the benchmarks, the competitive benchmarks that we've tested is anywhere between 10 and 15% on a general case. Um, some of the cases where new features were benefiting from, say, compressed OOPs or tier compilation or new, new performance you know, advantages that you have in 7, it was upwards of you know, 25, 30%. Now, JRocket, on the other hand, um, it's, it's, there's, a broader, there's a broader range. I mean, there are some applications. JRocket was highly tuned for middleware. Let's not kid ourselves, right? So there's situations where, where, we may, where we have met that performance. There are other situations where we exceed it. So it's between, you know, zero to 20% with, with, with JRocket. So one of the Are you moving away from that philosophy and just trying to make it with a more 
Sorry, could you repeat? I missed the part of the question there. So, like, one of the reasons they, that J Rocket in E3 was like compiling the entire code and putting it in four pairs and not going like hot spot type method. And now you're saying that you're moving away with that and just trying to make hot spot more faster with the same technology that Sun was always using. Yes, so the, the, the difference between JRock and Hotspot or sort of the Oracle, the JRock JDK, I should say, and the, the, the Oracle JDK now uh, was basically the JVM. There were two different JVMs, completely different code base. We shared the class libraries, so the difference were in, in the VM itself. And we had different philosophies around sort of the JRock, it was an, didn't have an interpreter. We were always compiling, and we were sampling and compiling. Um, in Hotspot, it's a different way of doing things in the sense that we do first an interpretation step and then you go into a compilation step. And it has its benefits of doing an interpretation first. We, so I don't think we will go to a sort of only compilation in, in Hotspot. I don't think it sort of, since we have a very good interpreter, it doesn't make sense. It, it's really helpful when you have, that there are different methods that sort of a lot of methods that you only use once and it, actually it's faster to interpret those and then sort of compile the ones yeah, that are actually executed yeah. multiple yeah. times. Um, but, and as, as the interpreter has been improved, the, the benefit of just doing a JIT compilation instantly has sort of dropped. And to be fair, we were actually thinking about should we add an interpreter into JRocket sort of towards to the last couple of years uh, yeah, for design acquisition, <laughs> and we didn't have to. Yeah, just to quickly add, with JDK 7, with the new comp with, with the updates to the compilers with GCC and, and, and the studio compilers, um, you know, I said that we saw a big improvement with, G with, with, with GC, but we all also saw it with the interpreter. And, and, and when we did measurements and compared, compared against JRocket, you know, Hotspot was faster with startup, significantly faster with startup. However, there were situations where that, that JRocket shined better because it was able to have full compilation or at least partial compilation before you actually got the load from the system. And we resolved those issues. Those, those, those workloads that we saw differences, or there are no differences yeah. anymore, so. And, and if you have a workload that actually is a bit beneficial of early compilation, using tiered compilation, you can actually play around with the settings a bit and get pretty close so that you basically do one interpretation step and then go over to compile code, for example. Uh, so you can set the thresholds pretty low when you, when you do tiered compilation and, and through that, basically, it's gonna look like you're doing instant JIT compilation. Yeah, we've kicked around ahead of time in Hotspot for a long time and never has it really been a benefit. I mean, we just, you know, we've had prototypes, you know, we've looked at it and we haven't gotten to the point where it actually beats the interpreter. <laughs> so we're just not, we're not going down that path. Uh, are you going to be getting rid of permagen space altogether? Eight. Yep. Yes. That change actually just went in, so I believe the next early access build of eight is going to have that feature in there. And uh, if you're interested and want to try it out, please do so. We're, that's a huge change. So yeah, yeah we really appreciate to, any testing yeah. of that one. Yeah, that's big. <laughs> I mean, we've we've done a lot of work. We 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 we're very ha we're happy with where we're at, but you know, it's a big code change. So yeah. Uh, the, that change set took a while to take. Oh, just merging oh. took three weeks. <laughs> just the merging. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, yeah, one, more. one more question. Yeah, time. Hotspot would definitely be optimized for both that as, as well as Windows. I, I would characterize it more as we focused, JRocket was more focused on uh, server workloads and, and sort of middleware workloads, whereas Hotspot has, a, has had a broader range from, from client and now we're focusing on sort of all the way down to embedded all the way up to the server there. So Hotspot has been more broader, but JRocket sort of, we, could, we knew that we were focusing on servers so we could cut corners like startup wasn't interesting for us because we didn't care about client really. Yes. Well, Hotspot is the preferred solution now. Oracle JDK is Hotspot. We do still support JRocket, and JRocket is still being used by some of the applications because, you know, it takes time to move. Um, but to your point, um, I think historically, JRocket probably, you know, definitely had, a, had an advantage on x86, um, whereas uh, Hotspot always had an advantage on Spark simply because of the, the, the roots with Sun. That, there is no difference anymore. One more. Get methods. Yes. And understandably, that that's you're allowed to do that. I may have a friend who's depending on that. 
<laughs> is there any way to access the class, the original class, uh, the shop file order of that uh, I don't think it is. The, the way you have to, the, the way you access methods are via the get methods, and you have an iterator. So it's similar to uh, sort of doing an iteration on a hash map, etc. Okay. It was a quality issue, really. We had to, we had to make that change. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, did you did you understand what Stefan's suggestion was as far as doing a sort or depend, well, a dependent sort? You get a consistent ordering, but right. If you actually yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Yes? In my experience, uh, the performance on x86 was always better than on Spark. Did the situation improve? I mean, I use Spark, so with Java 7, <laughs> did the performance balance a bit? So is, is the question, is, it, is it, this is more of a platform performance comparison question? Or? My experience is that, that on Spark, Java was performing a lot less than on x86. Okay. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, uh, How much? Well, let, I, let, me, let me say this way. The newer versions of the Spark microarchitecture are significantly faster, and they have a lot of new features that we've taken advantage of. You know, with the newer versions, starting with Spark T4, um, you would expect to see um, you know, higher levels of optimization. That being said, you know, we, we've, you know, uh, Spark, I, I think the, the workloads, uh, I, it's, it's very workload dependent. Um, I, I, I think uh, um, with T4 and, and, and uh, T4 was a general performance improvement, and we, we took advantage of all those features that we could. Um, but with, with that being said, with Java 7 on any of the Spark architectures, heavily threaded workloads are going to do very well. Um, but it, we can talk uh, specifically about the situation you're having, and we can, you know, I might have some insights. But in a general sense, it should be, you know, um, Spark and x86 are our premier platforms. They're treated equally. Um, so, so if we're not seeing performance improvements on Spark as we should expect to see on x86, that's a problem for us, and we, that's not acceptable. Uh, the improvements were both on x86 and on Spark, so the relative performance stays the same. I would say. Agnostic of the platform changes, yes. However, this last year we saw major, you know, releases from Intel and 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 Spark, um, and with those, of course, every time that happens, competitive differences, you know, shift. In the last major revisions from Spark, there was a very significant shift in performance. You know, um, I would say they're at. Well, it, as I said, it's equal. It's um, we treat them equally, uh, and, and workloads behave differently on dependent platforms. So, um, we can talk. We can talk off offline a little bit, and I can I can get you more information. No, one more. So, uh, is it a next step to the development on six will be frozen, so no major updates. We're already doing yeah, uh, and uh, and we basically already sort of since JDK seven was released, the the only things that gone into six has been bug fixes, security fixes. So no new features has gone into but six. After February, 2000, uh, uh, after February what's going to happen is that we're not going to do public releases of uh, JDK six anymore. So they will be available sort of via support contract. Okay. February. Uh, February 2013, so five months, roughly. <laughs> and again, you know, uh, you know, we would, in, the, in a perfect world, we would continue to support JDK 6, right? But we just, we got to focus our efforts, and we want to make, make sure that we move the language forward. And uh, so that's why we're doing that. So, so it's, it's um, similar to what uh, the state 1.4 and 1.5 is in today. Those are only available via support contracts. So no, security would be, we would issue a security fix. Is that correct? Or? Only critical ones. Yeah. Uh, if like there are highly, but. Uh, stuff you see in the, the if, if, you, if you see, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>